Good afternoon. Uh, the Raman Research Institute feels uh, proud and honored to initiate a special series of uh, colloquium level uh, lectures uh, in uh, honor of Professor Pancharatnam as we move into this year of our Platinum Jubilee. So we would like this to mark one of the many activities we'll take on. So Professor Pancharatnam joined the Raman Research Institute in 1952 as a graduate student, like many of us have. And he did his PhD, of course, uh, under Sir C. V. Raman. He was interested in crystals, and you know he discovered a very subtle effect in the interference of polarized light. And this discovery is recognized as a precursor to what uh, many of you would know as Berry's phase. In fact, uh, in the uh, you know, literature on geometric phase that is used in classical and quantum optics, um, uh, this effect is often referred to as the Pancharatnam Berry phase. And this is uh, you know, remarkable that this is one of the heritage science that came out of this, or legacy science, I would say, came out of this institute. And Raman Research Institute has continued in this area. At this point, uh, it's really glad to say that we have a very strong group working on light and its interaction with matter. They call themselves the LAMP group. And you know, this is for youngsters, I mean, the catch word now is quantum technology, quantum information. And that's the kind of uh, the fundamental aspects that go into that is the kind of research that's happening in the institute. Uh, so, Professor Ran uh, Pancharatnam uh, passed away in 1969 at a very young age of 35. And uh, we thought um, that this would be befitting the Institute to start a you know, lecture series. And I'm really glad that uh, we are starting this lecture series with someone who is a very well established researcher in the, you know, researcher by ex excellence in quantum optics and quantum information, uh, Professor Rupa Manjari Ghosh. Uh, she did her pre-doctoral studies in Kolkata, Calcutta University, I think it was called Calcutta University then. And she was a Roshri's uh, fellow, if I pronounced it right, in the, at the University of Rochester, which again, uh, roughly known as uh, Makkah for uh, optics, right? I mean, it's for, you know, even outside the field. And she started showing her, you know, uh, keen capability in research even at a young early age. As a graduate student, she had uh, research work uh, that has widely recognized uh, in creation of uh, entangled photon pairs, and you know, these are kind of and single photons, and uh, which are at the forefront of what we use for quantum optics and quantum. Uh, communication, quantum, you know, everything to do with quantum technology. So Professor Ghosh led an excellent research group at the Jawaharlal Nehru University for many years. And that's a very well uh, recognized uh, group with many of their uh, alumni from the group in very good positions across the country and probably like, across the globe. And over time, she of course uh, has also uh, worked in scientific administration where that's another aspect of her capabilities that have come out uh, as uh, while she was a journey as a dean and also uh, later a very transformative uh, ex you know, uh, contribution to the Shivnadir University which was just coming up and uh, she was the founding director of the School of Natural Sciences and later the vice chancellor. And uh, Besides her contribution to science research, she is also very keenly interested in the education uh, issues that plague it in terms of transforming uh, education system to make the best uh, possible, uh, you know, leading to many of the you know, problems that we have to contend with in terms of diversity, equality, uh, inclusiveness, and these. So I would like to uh, invite Professor Rukmanjiri Ghosh to deliver a lecture. Um, thank you all for coming for this uh, inaugural lecture.
Thank you very much, Tarun. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to be at RRI at this point in time in particular. First, that you are starting a lecture series in the name of Dr. Pancharatnam. And uh, it's really an honor to be the first speaker in this series. Uh, with a new director this year, with a lot of energy that I see on ground, it's a special year, no doubt. It's also a special year because uh, you know, RRI is going to celebrate, I understand, the Platinum Jubilee soon. So it's really my good fortune to be able to come back to this institute in this lovely uh, city and surroundings and the energy of all the PhD students that I see. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I prepared a lecture that's more a colloquium type. You know, I'm not going to go in the deep of anything and maybe at a later point, uh, some of my own work, maybe I will be able to uh, have the time to, to go into the deep end of it. But today, uh, the topic I have given is quite vast and I don't intend to cover all of it, of course. So I'll actually talk to you about three important points and I'll give you examples which would be, uh, unfortunately, biased towards my own work, but I'll get there. So uh, without wasting too much time, let me uh, just say this is not for the experts, uh, but hopefully then there will be uh, a point or two for everybody to uh, take home. Uh, so this is also very significant because uh, 2022, if you remember, has been declared by the UN as the International Year of Basic Sciences. And I think uh, how important it is, the part of sustainable development today I'll not talk about at all. But I think uh, this is, again, a very, very significant thing. And when I'm standing in the Raman Institute, this is one of my favorite quotes, actually. Ask the right questions, and nature will open the doors to our secrets. You know this, but uh, allow me to digress a bit. You know, this sort of defines all of us in this room who are researchers. Uh, when as a child I read this, and you probably are familiar with this, a wise person knows it and knows that he knows. Uh, an idiot, excuse my language, it was not how it was written, but I'm translating it in my language. Uh, a person who does not know but thinks he knows is an idiot. Uh, this country is full of them, I mean, everywhere. Uh, you do not know but you think you know. Not knowing is not a problem. That leaves the rest of us who do not know, but we know exactly what we do not know. So ask the right questions. That makes you a researcher. You know exactly what you do not know. And you frame the questions and then you probe it. And that's the meaning of this. And in this big uh, topic that I have chosen, this really is the, the clue to solving anything. You ask the right questions, and then nature will open the doors to our secrets. I was, uh, Tarun gave you a very uh, nice introduction, I don't know how much of it I deserve, but I was also was a part of NCRT, you know, those of you who have come to the CBSC syllabus, class 9, 10 science books were done by me and my team, so I am the cause of your trouble. Now, uh, in NCRT they are all very used to asking definitions, so I was asked in one of the meetings, um, what is physics? And I came up with this. Physics is a systematic attempt to understand natural phenomena in as much depth and detail as possible. And why do you want to know? You want to know because you want to use this knowledge to predict, modify, and control phenomena. That's the ultimate aim of physics. And that's what we are going to do with quantum mechanics, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But these two, last two, are qualifying remarks. One is uh, that physics tries to answer the question how things happen in nature and not really why things happen in nature. I mean, as a kid, of course you ask why the sky is blue. I'm not talking about the small whys, I'm talking about the big why. If you ask me, for example, why quantum mechanics works the way it works and not any other way, I don't know. So you want to believe in God, you know, there is no conflict with religion because or philosophy, because we physicists very cleverly has actually defined what it would be for us. We answer the question, how things happen in nature, and we probe and find it out. And we do not go a little beyond that. We leave it to the domain of uh, uh, philosophy to answer the big question, why things happen in nature. There are many questions we do not know the answers of, why you are born, why you are going to die, in between the time, what do you want to do? People believe in astrology, and that 
in that administrative post not too far in the past, I was asked to start a, you know, a course in astrology. And it, you know, Kepler's time, it took a long time to separate out astronomy from astrology. And I did not want to go back there. Nothing against astrology. It's good fun Sunday if you want to read in the newspaper what the astrological predictions are. But point I'm making is there's a difference between science and pseudoscience. There's a difference between science and philosophy and the domain of belief. So the third point bullet that I have written there, that's what defines physics for us. And today we are going to remember this while we are talking about quantum mechanics. Evolution of science in general, and physics for me in particular, happened when theory and experiment go hand in hand. And offshoot of this evolution process are applications that come out. So there are two points I'm making. One is when we probe how things happen in nature, for example, if you say medical science has 50% success rate, so does astrology, coin tossing, right? So that doesn't mean one is a science, so the other is also a science. And I was asked this question actually in a meeting. Point is that it's the process that you follow to define one thing as science and the other a question of belief because you cannot really prove anything uh, in, in an experimental way. So I don't want to preach too much about it, but this sort of is fundamental to whatever we do, uh, doing in quantum technology and those applications today. And if you are always motivated by applications, which uh, we need to be because you need a lot of money, the lamp group knows how expensive it is or legal or any, any experiment you take. So you need funding and when you go to the funders, they would always ask about the applications first. But if you are looking at the market today, and everything, uh, your research, everything you are just getting to immediate results, then 20 years later, there will be no product in the market, I can assure you of that. Uh, science, science evolution has been a necessary gamble, and it has paid off. When I went to the US to do my research in the 80s, uh, the laser was in the supermarket. But when it was discovered in the 1960s, to my men, people said, OK, it's a very good fundamental device, but what's the use? Now the laser is everywhere, right? So it, there was a time lag between a fundamental work and its application to come out in the market. That lag has shrunk uh, quite a bit today. Well, it started happening with information technology. Whether there is information and technology in it, there, that's another thing. But uh, biotechnology, you know, it's still, uh, there is a time lag. But otherwise, there is a time lag between wh what you do as a matter of principle in a lab and by the time it comes out to application, but I think this gamble must go on. It's a calculated gamble, and it has paid off. Otherwise, there is no future to human being. You're not going to, if you are in physics or doing some work uh, in research, uh, you're not going to be jobless. It's not like you're going to find an answer, and all answers would be found, so tomorrow you would have nothing to do. You are actually pushing the frontier of knowledge. The more you push, the better questions you ask. And therefore, I thought I would start with this. Anyway, this topic is very vast. I don't want to go in there, but I wanted to just mention it. Also, this is my one slide tribute to the great work that Tarun mentioned of Pancharatham's what I would call phase of light. And I'm going to give it a little bit uh, of a context of what I'm talking about. This phase, it has many definitions, like photon, many definitions. To an experimentalist, what it means is not really what a theoretical definition is. And that all of that I can talk about some of the time. But the point is that this is really an essential part of all that we do in physics. It's a ma major difference between, uh, you know, if the quantum phase did not matter, there would be no difference between your probability and probability amplitude. Classical field amplitude and intensity is the phase that makes you do closer theories, though you are actually can't really detect the phase. The phase, the wave phase, for example, can be measured by comparing the phase of the initial and final waves in an interference experiment. So I'm going to talk about this a bit, I mean, refer to this a bit. So this is really, uh, though Pancharatham's phase was, as was already mentioned, it's really a geometric or topological phase of light. There are many other phases, particularly in quantum mechanics, this is very complicated, state phase, uh, the mode phase, and so on and so forth. But uh, I think this is a topic that it deserves uh, a full lecture by itself or a series of them. Uh, the, uh, the other problem, of course, stays that you know, in the quantum domain, there is no Hermitian operator that you can construct, which would give you the observable fees. But I don't want to get into that. But essentially, what I just said, that in optics, for example, whenever the dynamics, the phase of the field does not play any crucial role, 
you are as good to do just classical wave theory. You don't need to do quantization of the field or anything, but whenever uh, it's the dynamics of the phase of the field that's responsible for an effect, you actually need to do a much more detailed theory. So the probability amplitude in quantum theory plays the role of wave amplitude in classical wave theory. So if the phase was not important, you actually did not need all that that uh, we actually play with in the quantum domain. Because of our inability to directly measure electric fields, as I said, there is an interference of light beams of photons, and that's what you look at. And always, from textbooks in schools, you, there, there lies a concept of what we call coherence. And today, I'm going to talk about this coherence a lot, I mean, I, in, in this little time that I'll take. So uh, this is, again, high school stuff. Classically, superposition of two waves, whether mutually coherent or not, always leads to interference. You don't find it in school textbook. They always say to observe a steady interference pattern, you actually need a constant phase difference. But classically, theoretically, instantaneous values are well defined. So superposition of two waves, even if they're incoherent, it would always lead to interference. It will not be a steady pattern, so you have to look closely within time intervals faster than the coherence time. But quantum description inherently says that you know anything that you measure is really like an expectation value, expected value of the light intensity in the state. That's the only meaningful quantity. And you are already bringing in the concept of some kind of an average right here, because the state of the field has to be specified. So it's a very elementary thing to say, but, but to realize whenever we teach children <coughs> that it's quantum mechanics that requires mutual coherence of interfering beams. Classically, it's not a requirement. <coughs> Steady pattern needs it, but if you have fast electronics, you should be able to see uh, independent uh, sources interference. And this is something that is important to remember. So I quickly move to <coughs> some of the counterintuitive quantum features, something that you have heard about. This is post-COVID. <coughs> I always have a problem. But it's good old double slit interference. And if you look at this Young's double slit interference pattern, you have this source. I'm assuming this source is of one color, one frequency. And it's shooting one photon at a time from the source to the detector. And in this screen, I have two holes, A and B, very small ones. They're very tiny holes. Thank you so much. So uh, you already are familiar, I'm sure that if I close one of the holes and let light pass through, assume that everything is symmetric. So if I close B and let A be open, then you get, say, 1% of the time the detector gives you some signal. If you do the reverse and close A and open B, you get, say, the same 1% of the time the detector clicks. When you open both, light plus light does not always give you light depends on the position of the detector. At certain points, when you open both, you get nothing. So it's not 1% plus 1% giving you 2%. Sometimes you get 0%. Sometimes you get 4%. And this is a typical example of interference. And that's something that, as you know, in Feynman lectures, the basic physics, you'd find in the first uh, volume, third, first chapter, he talks about this as that the double slit interference has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. It contains the only mystery. And by understanding it, I mean, nobody really understands it. That's the point. So I think I, the reason I'm going back to this basic thing is that when you shoot actually one photon, what happens? It has two possibilities of going through hole A or hole B. And every time you look at it, you get a tiny dot on the screen. But when you actually have millions of photons, uh, then the pattern emerges, dark light, dark light pattern, the interference pattern. So what exactly is happening? Dirac said to, to us that we should think of this single photon as being associated with both paths, S, A, D, S, B, D, both paths simultaneously. So it's like a Sai Baba effect. I'm here, uh, you're seeing me here, but you know, I, my wave function extends up to the Delhi. Okay, so, <clears throat> I'm in A, I'm in B, if I'm a photon, single photon of that kind. So uh, the uh, answer to this is that how does it work? So this is the theoretical understanding of this, that there's a probability of going through A, there's a probability of going through B, 
exercise the horrible name of reliability amplitude to emphasize on the point of the phase I talked about. And these two probability amplitudes interfere, giving you zero at some points and double and the square of that in other points. So there's no reality independent of observers or measurement. That was used to be the idea, does the moon exist? Yes, it does. How do you know? Because either I have observed it or somebody else who has observed has told me. So, but here, if you observe which way the photon went, and you can talk about an electron as well, the beautiful experiments available on the, on the net, then uh, there is no clear understanding of which way it went, right? So there is also no locality, like I talked about. So what if many photons or atoms or electrons can be linked in a single wave of light or matter? Okay, so uh, what, what does that mean to us? So all this talk that we have seen, and single photon interference in particular, the question I'm going to ask, following that NCRT definition, is what's the use? Okay, and today I'm going to actually elaborate on that uh, a bit. So we have worked on that, you know, this is uh, my PhD, and then afterwards also, uh, we have worked a lot on creating light in quantum states. And these are very precise definitions. What do I mean by a quantum state when the state of the field is not describable as a simple mixture of coherent states, so is Glauber, Sudarshan coherent state. So I think if you use these in independent sources, uh, for example, one that I had done was resonance fluorescence from single atoms, and the one that became very famous was twin photons from a down converter. And we could actually see how, what is the difference between the, these kind of interferences if you treat light fields as classical or you treat the light field as quantum. And so it's uh, possible to make two photons emitted by independent sources interfere. I put this statement in italics because this sort of seems to be contradicting Dirac's statement. Dirac had said, uh, the two photons can never be made to interfere. That's not really true, and my work was actually in that. But his idea of how to explain, say, and this is something that those who are working in this, it's uh, important to know which picture do you choose you know, in quantum mechanics. I mean, I worked extensively in that paper in Schrodinger picture calculations because they are similar to the state representation in quantum information. You truncate the time evolution at first order and derive a two photon wave function. And then most people who followed me afterwards, they followed this treatment of mine. Those who wish to do Heisenberg picture calculations where your operator carries the time uh, evolution, that's easier to compare with classical optics. And the, my picture, of course, you could not really do one on one. But both are equivalent. That was shown much later by Mitchell uh, in Barcelona. Uh, the two photons, what we found was that two photons can never be detected at two points separated by some odd number. So point is that the source is actually emitting two photons like this, and we are not touching the source, and I'm changing the position of two detectors. Depending on where the second detector is, the joint probability of detecting two photons, we are going through a zero. So this is really, again, a quantum mechanical interference uh, effect. And one photon, of the two photon detection, one photon must have come from one arm and the second one from the other, but we cannot tell which came from which. So two indistinguishable parts. And you have to add the two probability amplitudes with phase, <coughs> corresponding to the two indistinguishable parts. And these amplitudes would interfere destructively in certain pairs of points, certain pairs of positions of the two detectors. And this is exactly the, though I'm violating Dirac, but I'm actually using the quantum mechanical interpretation that he gave of interference. And this has become a textbook example. You can take a look at this. <coughs> this came out in uh, 2005, the last edition. And it's a nice thin book. Talks about the quantum challenge through experiments of this kind and has a really good coverage of uh, my work which I was not aware of, actually. In popular science, also, it has been talked about. What exactly, why is so important? It's a simple concept. It's like a spontaneous photon fission. Suppose this is a UV palm photon. In a, uh, photon and photon, they do not interact unless you go through a medium. A nonlinear medium is capable of doing it. Maxwell equations otherwise are linear. 
So with the source term, the, you bring in nonlinearity, and one photon can split spontaneously into two. That historically has been called a signal in idler beam. If you look straight and you can capture this, they look like these uh, infinite pairs. And they, they satisfy what we call the phase matching constraints of momentum and energy conservations. So a small fraction, only a small fraction my time, now it's much larger, of light can convert like this. Okay? And these two are like twin brothers or sisters. Okay? They exist. If one exists and you measure one, you know the other one is there, even without measuring it. Okay? So that's the beauty of these two photon experiments and the entangled photons, the source that I created. So this is, uh, it can be entangled in polarization actually, but that's another story. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of it. So this entanglement is what Einstein calls spooky action at a distance, 1935 and later. You probably have read some history. As if uh, one particle effectively knows something about the other particle instantaneously. They are separated by long distances, but my measurement on one or positioning of one is affecting how the correlation would work. This correlation concept was actually thought to be very spooky. I continued working in this uh, much later as well, and there are many interesting results that you'll find here. And what, what, why, again, uh, what's the use? Many applications, because these twins are, even if you're lousy, they're not lousy. The process is very smart. So they actually, uh, you know, even if you detect very slowly, they are together all the time. So you can actually uh, measure sub-picosecond time intervals at that time between two photons by this fourth order interferometry that I started, and so on and so forth. And in the presence of very high noise, background noise, if you code your communication through correlated signals using these two pairs, and this was realized even there in 1987, 88, there is a Japanese group that took the thing from me actually to work on that, and that was the first idea that you can use correlations rather than single channels when you have very high background noise to send signals. Now, where to? So, uh, you know, today the interest in quantum computer is mostly for AI, uh, the IBM and so and so forth challenges that you see. But for us, at the basic level, this was the idea. The idea was that if nature is actually acting like this, and you must have heard of the Schrodinger cat paradox, that if I put a live cat and a radioactive nucleus inside a box and assume that both are quantum mechanical, when I, if the radioactive nucleus decays, it releases some poison in the box and the cat dies. If it is not released, then the cat is alive. So when you do not open the box, opening the box and looking is an act of measurement. When you look, the cat is either alive or dead. But when you don't look inside the box, the cat is in a state of alive plus dead the nucleus in a state for decayed, not decayed, together. Upstairs, downstairs, Delhi, Bangalore, okay, all of this, so dead plus alive. So these are things, these are numerous possibilities of parallel processing that nature is actually quietly doing in its own way, in her own way, in the quantum world. So can we actually tap into that resource? And that's the idea. And instead of a same bit binary digit, you actually use a quantum bit or a qubit which, is, which has multiple, uh, uh, you know, manifold uh, information content and extremely rich. You can actually go into the details of this and figure it out, uh, the, the information content in this. So it's like maybe states, not no, not yes, not upstairs, not downstairs, maybe, infinite possibilities inside your maybes. So how to produce, observe, and make use of such powerful information rich states is the question today that I wanted to touch upon, and I'm sure some of you have read all of that point, and that's what is called the quantum challenge. So the quantum challenge that I'm using today is that quantum mechanics shows up in small enclaves within the classical macro world, and the behavior of the individual constituents that make up our world, see atoms or photons, they are described by quantum mechanics, but these particles are rarely isolated. And as they interact with the environment, they lose their peculiar quantum character. That's why you don't see a cat which is both dead and alive in our real world, because they have interacted with the, the idea, if you believe in the quantum dynamics, the idea is that they have interacted in their environment and they have taken one or the other state. So a central question in quantum physics is the mechanism of this transition between the quantum and the classical world. Is there a door? 
that from the quantum side I go to the classical world or is there a door? It used to be thought that it was just size. Not so. Uh, is, that is just the size that you go down in scale and keep hammering things down, ultimately your classical laws would flee. So I think this is something that we have been probing. What is the mechanism of transition if you believe from the quantum side? The second part of the quantum challenge is about measurement, and I don't want to elaborate on this too much, but one not only needs to keep a quantum system isolated for long enough. This long enough is the Kornstein concept. But also probe it so delicately so that it doesn't become dead or alive. It stays as dead plus alive. Right? So that's the, that's the idea. So single particle detection, this kind of problem was known even to Schrodinger. So that's 1952 or so. Uh, he called it postmodern physics. It's like uh, destroying the object under investigating. So only when it's dead, you can actually uh, do a postmortem on it. So uh, the observation of such fragile quantum effects and then making use of a system's quantum nature are tough and challenging tasks. But this has been done. Uh, you know, very recently, only in the end of March this year, there is a nice uh, review article called uh, Quantum Computing Has a Hype Problem by Shakur Das Sarma, most of you know. Uh, this came out in MIT Technology Review, and major thing that he's talking about is that the hype is because the quantum states disappear. This is the process of decoherence, and that's in the presence of environmental noise and error corrections that people know of are difficult. So uh, when would the technology catch up and produce that? Nobody really knows. And I think that is the main thrust. And we have actually worked on this quite a lot. So uh, the quantum computation problem, the main issue is that it relies on entanglement of large quantum states. It's not a question of one qubit. People are very happy, three qubit, five qubit, 11 qubits. So you actually need millions of them to solve uh, or perform efficient calculations. Now such states will interact with the environment and the nature of the interaction and the time scale over which it acts are critical inputs. Right? So the time scale within that you actually have to perform your calculations. So there are two kinds of problem, problem of damping and defacing in quantum systems and time irreversible outcome of a measurement. I do both theory and experiment. It's an ideal thing for theoreticians in the audience. It hasn't been probed in some details because it's very difficult. And so how well do we understand the process of loss of coherence and emergence of classicality? Now, to, because we have worked on, on this problem for ages uh, at one point, so uh, there are three things that happens when the system you assume it to be coupled to its environment. I'm speaking from the quantum side. So I believe in quantum dynamics. I want to understand how classical dynamics emerges from there. So energy may be irreversibly transferred from the system to the environment. So that's well-known process of dissipation. Then there is, of course, diffusion. So fluctuating force exacted by the environment. And these two effects you know for both classical and quantum systems. In the quantum domain, there is an additional feature. And uh, as the system and environmental degrees of freedom get entangled, a coherent superposition of quantum states may be destroyed in the process that's called decoherence. Now, uh, so you need to work on, when, if you're looking at such problems, the time scales of evolution of the system plus environment. There is a scale associated with the natural frequency of the isolated system. There is a relaxation time scale corresponding to the frequency determined by the coupling strength. There is a memory time associated with the highest frequency present in the environment. And of course, the temperature of the environment puts a scale which measures the relative importance of quantum to thermal effects. Okay? So I think you can set up, depending on the various scales that in your problem is, you can set it up and actually try to work through it. This is a summary of how we have approached. And if it is getting, it's actually quite simple what I'm talking about is that if you have a spin system and take only two states up and down, the detector uh, can also detect, say, up and down. And the density matrix you set up looks like that. And if you choose a clever basis like this, then it looks very simple like this. So if the, uh, if the, uh, the wave function of this composite system is like this, then it's mod A square, mod B square in the, in the diagonal terms. Those, the, those are the probabilities that we all understand. And this, what I have shown in blue are uh, the off-diagonal terms that we call coherences. Now, they're classically unacceptable and essentially quantum. And the, so the reduction mechanism is something that you read in textbooks and have problems with the textbook definition. You hear about von Neumann reduction hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that's brought in from outside to quantum mechanics. 
if you believe in quantum dynamics, von Neumann is outside that. It says that, well, somehow this pure rho gets a uh, mixed reduced density matrix and you just set them to zero. How it happens, you don't give any explanation for it. Okay, because this is what you see. Now, of course, some of you, if you are not familiar with this, you would say, actually, this is not what we measure. We measure one or one here, right? Up or down. Uh, now, that second reduction is uninteresting because it's like a classical probability distribution, you know, collapse of that as a result of measurement. But the, the first one is where we have a problem, that how do you actually set these orbitals to zero? What is the mechanism of that reduction? And if you know that, that is the time scale in it. It doesn't happen instantaneously. And you have to, to make a quantum computer, you actually need to work within that time scale to preserve coherences. And that's the point I'm making. There's a whole lot of work we have done some years back. Uh, and the interesting examples, I don't have the time today to wait, get into it, but the, you know, I can filter it and tell you what it is maybe some of the time. So this is something that we need to study a lot more. Even today, Shankar Dasarma is saying there's a lot of hype because of this problem, because everything is decohering. You need to approach it if you believe in quantum mechanics, believe from the quantum side, try to get into classical dynamics out of quantum systems by modeling your environment interaction. And you get wisdom like which one is your uh, basic state to be chosen. And it depends on the coupling that you do. Now, of course, we are talking about it today because in spite of this decurrence problem, there have been spectacular progress is made. And I mention only one uh, because of uh, this, uh, this citation. In 2012, the Nobel Prize, uh, many of you have personal experience working at ENS. I was invited by uh, Claude Quintanaji too, and Sir is a good friend. So, you know, what does it say for groundbreaking experimental methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems? And there are many like that. But I want to show you one picture. I don't know how many of you have seen in this. This is, uh, I've taken it from the Nobel Lecture of Serge uh, in 2012, and he showed this picture. Uh, 46 years of history in the same lab room. So this is a picture that was taken in uh, 1966. Uh, so this is Kastler. He got the Nobel Prize in 1966. Poin Tanuji got the Nobel Prize in 1997. And this is Sarge Harosh, who got the Nobel Prize in 2012. So I'm saying that, you know, it happens that some labs create this tradition of working in the same area, three Nobel Prizes in the same lab room. And I happened to have met, well, uh, Kastler was gone, but the others. So anyway, there are other examples like that. But what is the point? Point is that why are you talking about it? A new way to trap light, there is a lot of uh, you know, you know, good articles on this. And ultimately, there is a lot that you can say about optical systems. Now, uh, I'll not get into the details of each one of it. But the big major problem in optical systems you find is what I have already alluded to, that photons interact incredibly weakly with each other, Okay, unless you mediate by a medium. Otherwise, Maxwell's equations are linear. And you have to have some nonlinearity for photon-photon interactions to happen. And that you provide a medium that allows it. It could be also because of a cavity where you actually make them interact. So that's one problem. The other, <coughs> other is that if you really want to quote uh, and preserve, and you quote the quantum information in light pulses, but you want to preserve them, then light is very difficult to localize. That brings in immediately the question of computing memory of based by atoms. So a typical computer uh, network could be channels of photons and nodes of atoms. Okay, I'm going to elaborate on that. In that respect, we have worked a lot. And again, the reason I've chosen this particular series of work of ours is because of somebody that you know very well. So it's a work on EIT, as the name suggests, it's electromagnetically induced transparency. It's transmission of resonant light through otherwise opaque medium. It's through a control. Again, the control word that I used in NCRT. And the nice thing about optics is not, the transformation is not permanent. The moment you turn off the control laser, everything is back to normal. Okay? So how do you cancel resonant absorption? Because a lot of good physics happens there, but you actually see nothing. Because at resonance, light gets absorbed in matter. 
So when nothing comes out, you actually cannot observe anything. So if that is the case, then can you beat it? And this is an old physics idea, but it got revived by some of us. So in simple terms, this is a two-level system that you learned in first year MSc or even uh, last year of your undergraduate degree, that if I'm shining a laser of uh, frequency omega and the uh, the frequent, resonant frequency between these two levels or the energy separation is h bar omega naught, this is typically your absorption profile. When this delta is zero, that means they are resonant, you have maximum absorption and correspondingly you have a dispersion curve that looks like this. So if I add a third level and shine a control laser on it, the absorption and dispersion profiles get modified drastically. And this is what they start looking you create a transparency window where you used to have maximum absorption. So absorption goes down, that means this is a transparency window now. And dispersion also then moves in a very funny way. So if this shape happens, then with transparency, you also have extreme positive dispersion in this window, and you can create what we call slow light. Okay, slow light, what does it mean? Light, as you know, is the highest speed that we know of transmission of information and that's 3 into 10 to the power 8. So uh, it's nothing new that your uh, speed inside a material medium would be slowed by some kind of, sorry, a formulation like this, where this free space speed you divide by the effective refractive index. 3, 5 in semiconductors, uh, 1, nothing, then uh, maybe water 1.5. But can I actually make this index go up to uh, say 10 to the power 5, 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 7, 10 to the power 8, then actually you would have light cycling at the speed of uh, bicycle, or then the fundamental question I would like to ask, can you stop it? If you can slow it down, is there anything preventing us from stopping light inside a medium? And actually the answer is yes, you can. So how slow can it get? And this is what we probed. Again, before I move forward, this is again the idea of quantum interference, and it, it actually confronts us with two fundamental quantum ideas, very strange ones. One is probabilistic interpretation. Second is addition of probability amplitudes for indistinguishable paths. I'm going to give you an example which is very different. So if you want to not do the Hamiltonian, which we have done, you have to do it. Solve the actual problem because it's no longer the bare atom plus light. It's actually the addressed state that emerges. But you want to really understand it, then the physics of EIT can be understood that if I'm shining a probe laser from this arm to that arm, and this one is actually should be getting absorbed completely, but it's not getting absorbed. I'm inducing a transparency when I actually shine this coupling laser. So that happens because of multiple routes of excitation of this population. This is a cartoon, don't take it literally. So there are two channels, one is a direct B2A, the other one is indirect, which we are mediated by this coupling beam. These two paths interfere. Okay, not the actual lifting of population. That's a cartoon. Quantum interference of these two probability amplitudes are two paths. They, they cancel each other. Uh, if they cancel, that means this, uh, on this path, you have no absorption because they have canceled each other. That happens when you're coupling beam or the pump beam is actually very strong and that's what we are actually seeing. And this happens within a coherence time. And it so happens that today I'm speaking in Raman Research Institute, this is the Raman coherence time. So if you look within this coherence lifetime of the lower levels, that in that you would be able to observe this quantum interference effect of EIT. It's the funny part of EIT doesn't stop here. This is a general EIT scheme. You need a lambda of this kind. And the, the, if you solve the, uh, the right Hamiltonian, you would find that this state is what we call the dark state. It's one of the eigenstates of the problem. It's a dark state because it's on resonance, but poor thing doesn't see the light because nothing gets absorbed. So it's as if it's a dark state. And so you can actually then look at that uh, transmission window and look at how slow is uh, slow. The photons with zero rest mass cannot be addressed. So you cannot stop it. 
But when you have lightness of matter interactions, you have dressed photons, in this case what is called polariton. So they are joint oscillations of light and collective atomic dipoles. They have non-zero rest mass and that have zero velocity in a moving frame of reference. In this case, it's a moving medium. So uh, this came out only in May. There's a nice uh, Fitzgerald letters, not on this principle, it's different. But it talks about self-stopping of light via self-interaction mediated by resonant nonlinearity in a homogeneous medium, which is very different from what I talked about, but they are related. Now, uh, when the light stops, that information that you are sending by incoming light is stored in collective atomic excitations. And let me show you, uh, 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 again, a cartoon. So by quantum memory, what I'm talking about is converting a flying qubit into a stationary qubit, or vice versa, retrieving it at will. It should not be random. And so storage and uh, on-demand on retrieval of protocol would look something like this. You know, you have a three-level system, and your population, whatever the population is, uh, are all in this lower state B. So the medium is looking like that. You turn on your control laser. OK, nothing is happening in there. Then I turn on the probe pulse. And the probe pulse comes, it comes. When it get, gets inside, so within the Raman coherence time, I turn off my control laser. When I turn it off, then the state of the light is stored in the Raman coherences of the two lower ones, as I talked about. OK, so this it would stay like that till I turn on. If I want to now retrieve, on-demand retrieval would mean I turn on the control back on. When I turn it on, <coughs> the original uh, probe beam comes out, and here it goes. So the theme of this that I'm talking about is control of the behavior of the atomic medium to switch between transparency, and you can do it also for absorption. I'm not, I'm not shown it. At multiple frequencies, create logic gates, and so on and so forth. And the entire process relies on quantum interference between multiple paths of absorption and emission. It's really true. And what is the big thing about this is that <coughs> this is an example of bulk quantum mechanics. And I can work on atomic ensembles. And that's where you actually see this. The first trick was to select a simple usable atomic level configuration. I don't have. Uh, I have one example because deep down I'm always looking for systems which would be easy to actually uh, work with. You cannot actually have a quantum computer where the entire quantum computing system looks really cumbersome or they need ultra cold temperatures or the level scheme is very, very. So I'm still searching. I don't have an answer, but I'm posing what I think is the problem. So here I'm talking about a not so fragile quantum coherence problem. So it's really bulk quantum mechanics. And we looked for a system at room temperature, and that was uh, for helium-4. Helium-4, you know, you have actually made a stable helium. People have worked in uh, low temperature, but this is the time that we selected. I don't want to get into the details of it. There are many nice things, even collisions, that everybody discouraged us, saying that it will not work at room temperature. It actually worked very well. Uh, and uh, this is what I was talking about. Probably most of you are familiar with Fabian. You used to visit here. But I had a very long-standing collaboration with Fabian Bretnecker and Fabian, and very Indian-looking. This is actually back of my JNU house. Uh, so we did a series of uh, projects with uh, Sefi Pram. Every time, even after I moved to SNU as a vice chancellor, we continued. And actually, we got really good results. And I'm going to show you several things, but I'm going to concentrate on only one part of the atomic memory. Uh, let me move to this. What I was talking about is that a typical quantum information system will, will have probably photonic channels that are appropriate for quantum communication over distance because of the fast transmission speed and weak interaction with the environment, but they are difficult to store. Atomic nodes, on the other hand, would be good quantum memories but difficult to transport over distance. The real problem is that when you create such an atom photon network, in the quantum domain, the problem is information transfer problem. I could have put a quote on information as well. You're transferring an information which you do not know. So the moment you know, you measure, it doesn't stay quantum, right? That's the problem. So here you're dealing with 
something that you have coded a qubit, say one, in the photonic system, and you are to transfer it to the atomic system without knowing what the hell it is, and you want to retrieve it exactly the way it was initially, without knowing what it was. Okay, and this is a, a very big problem. We have worked on this, and uh, you know, for reasons uh, known to us, I mean, we submitted it to Pramana, which was again housed in this uh, for some request. Uh, question is, how slowly can we turn off or turn on the control field? What is the impact of spontaneous decay? If you work this out, that adiabatically transfer the information in cavity uh, QED framework. So I think there's a lot more work. We got very nice results in this. I don't want to get into this one. So there have been a uh, lot of work done, and there is a recent review for those who are interested in that. Uh, it's, it's a pretty good one, actually, by, from this Chinese group. It came out only in March this year, EIT quantum memory for non-classical states of light. So it has been realized in warm atomic cell, cold atoms, solid systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I think very nice results you started seeing even in room temperature cesium cell. Cold atom has practical difficulties on, in the field. So can you actually do it? And it, amazing that these people were able to do using what I talked about, uh, somehow managing decoherence. Uh, it was first done through a series of theory. To uh, get to, into a decoherence-free subspace of spin states, they could have a storage time of one second. And that's quite remarkable. For our, our case, we had only a millisecond, few milliseconds. Okay, so I think this was a uh, high, high atomic density is also another problem. You need it high, but high also means collisions. So you need to actually carefully design these things to, to overcome these difficulties and it's happening. A quick aside for those of you who are interested, you know, Einstein's causality says that uh, information cannot be transferred faster than the speed of light. When you are starting to do the slow light problem, you realize that, uh, that the curve I showed had very funny slopes. So it's possible to actually get to fast light where this ng factor that I showed earlier could be less than one. So your group velocity could be greater than c. When I was a student, uh, it came out that phase velocity could be greater than c. Initially, there was a lot of uproar. People said, OK, but phase velocity doesn't contain information. But group velocity does. I think textbooks should be rewritten. Group velocities also can be you know, uh, exceeding c. But this doesn't violate Einstein's causality. Uh, I don't have time to talk about this is a topic by itself to talk about this. But we have actually done experiments with this backward light as well. When uh, ng is negative, which is possible in our case, and the group velocity would become negative. What does that mean? Before entering, it's coming out. But we need to actually think about it. Basic clue is if you are wanting, wanting to know the answer is that the description we use to talk about propagation fails under certain conditions which have not been probed earlier. So it's this fast light that is moving faster than the speed of free space light uh, is counterintuitive, but I'm stressing that it does not violate causality. Information is better described by discontinuous front velocities. It's discontinuous. You have to turn on something, and that cannot be described by the regular dispersion theory you study in textbooks. Anyway, this is really an aside. We have done a lot of work on this. I don't want to get into that. And this uh, transmission resonance problem I talked about using EIT, you can actually do it by other mechanisms as well. And the student of mine actually worked on coherent population oscillation. And so here also you can actually trap, have these ultra narrow resonances uh, using the CPO, coherent population oscillation. We have played with the not just go for a lambda, but a double lambda, you know, more complicated, but again, room temperature helium, another level scheme. And uh, there are four level atomic system, three classical fields, so you know, a lot of calculations to be done. But three Raman coherences, two dark states, uh, but possibilities are immense, and I'm just not going to tell you anything. We have actually worked this out very nicely and had seen that this system can be useful as a polarization dependent switch in the presence of a magnetic field and many more things. Uh, we have actually played around with light storage capabilities. <coughs> in these CPO uh, systems. 
uh, in February 2017, we had a PRL uh, talking about a current population oscillation based light storage in this, where we talked about uh, introducing a, a, a quantity, an entity called populariton, not polariton, and so and so forth, because that's uh, it's, it's very interesting. So I want to end now by saying how close are we to realize the dream of quantum information processing. Uh, seen this cartoon, how is your quantum computer prototype coming along? Great. The project exists in a simultaneous state of being both totally successful and not even started. Can I observe it? That's a tricky question. So from this, there's been a lot of progress. Okay. So uh, real systems, you know, people have worked on trap times. I'm just giving you a summary now. First qubit was in 1995 by Dave Weinland and Chris Monroe and colleagues at Nest Boulder, and then solid state superconducting circuits. You must have seen images of this. It's a 127 qubit. That's the IBM Eagle processor that's regarded as the most powerful processor, and Google has been also following this. The real excitement was again this year. The two Nature papers came back to back on 20th April. One was from uh, Lukin of Harvard and Sackman and company uh, using two different systems. But both are using talking about the first quantum processors that use neutral atoms as qubits. Produced in, this was done independently by these two groups. And there's a, <coughs> a review of all of this in Physics World 27th of April. <coughs> Why is this result a milestone that I've written here? Because atomic neutral atom quantum computers are easier to scale up than the two earlier technologies I talked about. Neutral, so interaction is less, and that's something that's extremely useful. So I think then there is a revived hope of all of this, but typical setup, I'm, I'm not going to show the details, but the Madison setup looks like this. I mean, it's very complicated. I don't see the field application of this. So you guys have to uh, work hard and figure it out, but I'm you know, willing to bet on systems that would be maybe a little more simpler to, to fabricate on a chip. So. <coughs> This is something you may have seen, it just came out, I just read it last week in Nature, 25th May. Uh, they're talking about quantum teleportation, the spooky action at a distance that I talked about, again now being uh, demonstrated, systems were different. I mean, it's not the same systems, but optical fibers played a role. So uh, information between locations across without actually moving the physical matter. So it's information propagation without moving the physical matter. And this has actually uh, really nice because this is the future of quantum internet powered by quantum teleportation. This can provide a new kind of encryption that is theoretically unbreakable. So uh, people are talking about hybrid computing. What's the right combination of pure quantum, quantum inspired and classical computing? And that seems like for most problems, that's the way forward. For me, the moral of the story is uh, evolution would continue with theory and experiment going hand in hand and useful applications would come out, and scientific methods will continue. So uh, with this, I think I've uh, given you an overview. I hope some points got through. I'll be happy to take on questions if you have. Thank you very much for your attention. We thank Professor Bhumanjali Ghosh for an excellent first Pancharatnam lecture. So time for some questions. It was an overview of a difficult subject. Maybe I have to come back to talk about specifics and to excite the students to ask more questions. Yeah, I just start with, uh, I mean, uh, this decode idea, I mean, see, I have encountered that in the context of, you know, quantum cosmology and things like that. So uh, my naive understanding, I mean, because I have not looked at it, so is measurement looked as a limit of extreme decoherence which diagonalizes the density matrix, or is decoherence fundamentally different from making a measurement? So it's a two-step thing. So uh, the coupling basically says that the, the dynamics, the evolution, is not as simple as you take, because you just leave out. So how is it, for example, the uh, experiments I did, how is it that those two photon states were not affected by the environment? So that's one kind of part of question. Second is what you exactly said, that when you, by doing the measurement, the collapse happens. But doing the measurement, the collapse happens, which is the second stage I talked about. Mm -hmm. 
the off diagonal vanishing is something that's the first stage and i think that's something that i'm saying that we need to understand it if you believe in quantum mechanics you cannot import ideas like random reduction from outside so it's an ad hoc uh, reduction uh, hypothesis and i'm trying to give a quantum meaning to that reduction hypothesis so so my type i understanding then was you integrating over unknown degrees of freedom hence the uh, you know, density matrix is diagonalizing precisely you can model with typical ways of how you know this happens but i agree i mean it's not uh, giving you a measurement but it's giving you a diagonal thing which when so measurement and decoherence are two separate concepts right? yes they i would say one and two i mean they're both very peculiar yeah but measurement you know classical statistics also has measurement issue i mean coin tossing but that's not uh, not having the full information with you if i looked at here initial condition known i measured how much thrust i am giving everything else is known so i would be able to predict every time what the measurement outcome would be so that's a separate statistical problem for me the first problem is vanishing of those of diagonal elements which are which contain the quantum coherence between like the raman between the between two states and that has no classical analog and the reason i'm emphasizing on that if you when you look at particular systems and see how they are coupling with the environment some uh, variables uh, lend themselves to be the preferred ones in that the density matrix would be diagonal not in all you know there this strange stories in there and experimentalists are not looking enough to see we did it a simple stranger luck and we find the momentum is the preferred one when you couple with the space nobody understood it not even the referees and calculation is all correct and now people are realizing that their natural choices based on the interactions that you have done so i think it should be looked at carefully thanks this question there So this is uh, to do with this uh, the, uh, this induced uh, transparency yes. example. You said that uh, there is interference between two different parts. So are these specifically histories in the sense of uh, uh, parts of uh, in space and time that you're talking about in the same way that we no, talk it's the energy space I'm talking about frequencies. Okay, okay. So, so uh, those two states are basically precisely interfering. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank yeah, you. Exactly. There are two more hands there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so you mentioned that uh, ideally we need millions of qubits, uh, but uh, is not it true that uh, using a smaller number of qubits, that we can solve a class of problem which is classically intractable? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you can. What I meant is that you know, right now the technology, the way I understand it, it is that you also have to allow for the these quantum qubits, uh, technology qubits, and then this physical ones that you have additional ones that take care of your errors. <clears throat> so even in a small calculation, you always have extra bits that you need for error correction. Okay, so numbers are more, but to solve whatever the classical computer can do, you're not interested in doing it that way. You want to do it better, for that you need many more. But the major part comes from the correction. Yes. Yeah. So, can you please say about the backward light and fast light? Backward light. And yes, I'm glad. <laughs> it's a. I need some talk about that. What I showed clearly, uh, there is nothing fundamentally wrong with the equation I was writing, right? So, when you write that, you basically ultimately come with your velocity, group velocity through the medium, is c divided by some effective group index like refractive index, right, that ng. Now, the entire calculation is based on a first order truncation. You consider higher order terms less important than the term you have ended with. When you have a discontinued bump like this, when you're coding with an information, you're actually having some kind of a code like this, right? After it's a smooth curve, it extends from minus infinity to plus infinity. There is no concept of speed. So it has to be on that smooth Gaussian say some disruptions like this. Whenever you have these discontinuities, you can't do the theory you are used to do for dispersion. It's actually a simple answer like that. But then you have to go back and do the fundamentals, which I tried to do. It's basically that. 
So uh, the way we describe things as moving, that it's very disturbing actually if you go through it, that, uh, that description fails. Um, hello ma'am. Yes. Thank you for the talk. So my question involves galaxies actually. Um, so decoherence happens when the density of atoms is very less and very more. So it will, if we consider photons being emitted from let's say a distant source, the, is it possible that whatever we are observing from distant galaxies, these photons are being uh, entangled with photons from the source galaxy? Okay, so uh, yes, first answer is yes, it's possible. But to see those, for example, there is a catch that uh, coherence I was talking about. So for example, in this down convert, if these two were, uh, let me take one example. If these two are produced as twins, okay, and I'm trying to actually converge them and I'm trying to measure the interference between the two, okay, if I move away from the center, so for larger coherence times, you would not see it really. So there is always a limit that is, uh, that you're working within. So if you, uh, if for some reason the coherence times are that large, which is possible for certain frequencies actually, uh, but it's the width of the frequency band that determines this coherence. And in fourth order interferometry, the width doesn't matter. That's uh, what I was talking about. So it's possible, but I doubt that far off the center part, you'll be able to see any of this. But what looking at it? Good, thank you. So you said something that the probe laser was uh, first being absorbed and then you switched off the coupling laser and then we can retrieve the state of the light uh, like when we want. So like there is a certain lifetime of the uh, resonant transition, right? Like uh, the upper state where it is getting excited. The only time scale that matters, uh, for example, it's a very good question, uh, that I talked about metastable helium because of 1000 nanoseconds of whatever lifetime, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is how much time, what is the coherence time of the light beam going through? right through the laser. So when you are uh, going through it like in a diffuse, not a ballistic motion, but a zigzag, 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 then you spend, say, millisecond in my case, in the laser, and that becomes your Raman lifetime order because it increases the Raman lifetime. So only time scale that matters is the coherence between the two lower spin states. That, that's the time scale you have to work on, not on the transition uh, decay state. So within the Raman coherence, it's a nonlinear process. So there's a second order, third order, phenomena. So uh, that coherence time is what determines. Within that you have to do these measurements. So within the coherence time we have to retrieve information. Right. Thank you. So I have a question on the EIT thing you are talking about. So like for a three-level system in a lambda system, you talked about the probe and the control laser. So like it can be explained in terms of two paths, like so two interfering paths, either it is directly probe uh, transition getting accelerated or the probe and then the intermediate with the control. So can this be equated to a two slit double slit experiment where like the, there are two paths going through the two slits? Uh, not exactly because yeah. as I think I answered the question, it's in a different space. Yeah. It's not the physical space as in a double slit experiment because okay. you are talking about the wave function in terms of space coordinates. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly interference has been in space coordinates. Here, the coordinates I'm talking about are in energy. Okay. okay. And sometimes, in some papers, you'd see I'm talking in terms of polarization space. So spaces are different, but the concept is that. Okay. 